You will probably notice I'm not a native English speaker, so uh, if uh, you don't understand anything, please give a yell. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a few projects we did together with our students and with some media companies. Uh, if you have questions during this presentation, please do interrupt. Uh, um, if you have questions about the media landscape in Europe, I can uh, answer those questions, of course. Uh, I can give a more international uh, spectrum. Uh. Uh, I always use this example to start my, my storytelling session. Uh, probably you know it, eh, but the most uh, 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 popular piece in 2013, which is way long ago, was a quiz eh, by the New York Times, and it was made by an internship. Eh. But we are still struggling, also in Belgium, with, with uh, media and a lot of media companies with us. It's really crisis. Eh, the, the newspapers are in crisis, and now broadcast is also following. And we have a lot of people getting fired, especially traditional broadcast people. And they're doing stuff like this on social media. Hopefully, the sound will work. Well, it's from, from a radio station. They want to um, uh, make their radio reports work on uh, social media, and then they do experiments like this. It doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. Eh? And what a normal production pyramid is like, <coughs> also in Belgium, eh, you start with your story, subject and story angle, then you have a target group, then you define your platforms, you go into production and post-production, and in the end result you have a television uh, documentary, for example. Eh? Uh, the VRT, which is the, the public broadcaster in Belgium, in the Flemish region, the Dutch-speaking part of Belgium, the northern part where Bruges is, probably you know that city. <laughs> eh? so, uh, they had a, a project which, which is called Dit is Vandaag, eh? this is today, and they turned around the, the, the production pyramid. Eh? They started with a theme, which was education, and that's it, eh? and they started directly into production. So they made a lot of what they called media objects, eh? games, infographics, uh, and so on and so on. All about the same theme, but with different story angles. And they weren't in relationship to each other. Yeah? At the end, eh? they tried to make a television documentary with those media ob objects. <coughs> yeah? It failed. It didn't work was no good uh, uh, TV uh, documentary. It didn't air. Eh? It wasn't uh, aired. Eh? And why? Because probably your, your story angle, your tension span, it was all very uh, randomly chosen and it didn't work. But what did they see was that the, the, the reach of all those media objects, like the game, the infographics, the YouTube series, and so on and so on, was rather big, eh? long tail principle, long tail principle. So now they are using, for some of their projects, eh, they still use this reverse production pyramid. Mm -hmm. And it all has to do with, with different, different ways of uh, consuming stories. Eh? And we are, you all know, eh, we are going from a, a linear to a non-linear way of consuming stories. So we also need, or we also have different story patterns. Eh? So we took a closer look into those different story patterns. We tried to uh, make a, a list of it. Eh, there are thousands of story patterns in Essential, eh, but you couldn't define a few ones. Eh. And this was rather popular, especially when the YouTube uh, de decision tree, sorry, uh, and the choose your own path videos uh, rose more than 10 years ago. Eh. They're still, when designing immersive storytelling, eh, they're still applicable also. Eh. I'm going to my first user case, which is called Brickland. And Brickland was the, the first interactive documentary in Belgium, also a few years ago. I'm coming to more recent projects in a few minutes. Uh, bear with me. Uh, Brickland, Brickland is about um, a region in, 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 in Flanders, in a Flemish region, where there was a lot of clay. Uh, that's why it's called Brickland. Uh, and before we, we started the production, uh, we try to define some story worlds. Eh? And story worlds, for me, that's the, the new scripting. Eh? And this is, for example, probably you know Bear 71, a famous example of, uh, of, uh, of an interactive documentary. Eh? And this was the story map or the story world we created. We created. Eh? So we analyzed it and we tried to put it into a story. 
Maybe you, uh, you know this uh, project, Refugee Republic. Huh? I will show it. Yes, okay. It's about a It's about, well, I can, if you have seen it, it's about a, uh, a refugee, Syrian refugee republic, uh, sorry, a camp. Uh, <coughs> can I show you the figure? And you can walk around in the camp. Uh, you can take different routes uh, uh, from uh, wandering, it's called a stroll, come slim where they discuss an, uh, the, the, the educational part of the camp and so on. And this was the um, story map for the story world of Refugee Republic. Eh? You had an intro, you had the map, you had four storylines. Eh? You could walk. If you walked, you did horizontal scrolling, that's walking. Eh? If you want to go deeper into one story, you had to go vertical. Eh? So this was the kind of navigation and, and this was the story world. It's a combination of linear and nonlinear, of course, yeah, because the linear parts are the four stories, the nonlinear parts are the vertical stories. You can choose it, but you don't have to. Yeah. Story worlding is, is rather old. Yeah. This is one from Disney years ago. Yeah. But don't, uh, um, well, it's not the same. Yeah. This is more franchise, and franchise is not the same as a real story map, yeah, as a real story world. Yeah. I always uh, try to, to, to give the difference between multimedia, cross-media, and transmedia. Eh? And multimedia is, is, is the old way of thinking, and what we call in Dutch, we forgot the website. That's multimedia. Eh? So a lot of newspapers still work like that. Eh? We forgot the website. <laughs> Uh, please put the text on the website. That was multimedia. <laughs> cross media, cross, uh, cross media was the next step. Cross media, they altered the different stories. Uh, uh, it, it's the same story, but you had it on different platforms in a different way. And then transmedia, of course, uh, you all know that uh, transmedia are different stories on different platforms with interaction with each other and you have a kind of way of public participation eh? and now with immersive storytelling of course we're going to deep media where you are the story be part of the story yeah. so for brickland we started designing and this was our first design it was on, on some paper eh? and this was our first story world eh? you had three periods eh? 1910 to 70 which was the, the rise of, of of that area then the decay from 17 to 90 and then the phoenix from the ashes, eh, uh, with, with the, here was a lot of uh, uh, unemployment, and here there was a uh, uh, nature and, 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 stuff, and Tomorrowland, maybe you know Tomorrowland, the festival, that's Brickland, that's, that's on that uh, area. And so this was a story, very traditional story, um, and we did some different media objects, eh? Uh, about social, geographic, economical, uh, and so on and so on. And there was video, audio, photo, and so on. Eh? So it was an interactive documentary with lots of layers. Eh? And we started with the production, but we immediately also started with the digital production. Eh? And I find this very important if you design transmedia storytelling, that you start together with your <coughs> digital production team. Eh? If I do consultancy for newspapers or for big media companies in Belgium, eh, that's the biggest mistake. A lot of journalists or storytellers, they start eh, and somewhere half in the production process, they think about their digital production. And then there are already made mistakes or opportunities were missed and so on. So what we do now with newspapers, we put everybody together from the start. Okay. So, yeah? What is production without digital production? If it's a digital product, so what do they do without digital production? No, make video, for example, and then think about how are we going to, 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 to uh, where, where are we going to put the video, or how, how are we going to uh, see the video. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, that's what I call. Yeah, no, I got it. Yeah. So think about your, pro because I'm a television director, and I'm, I'm very old school broadcast, and I think in pre-production, production, post-production. Post -production, eh? Websites, uh, website builders, they think in, in wireframing, in design, in user testing, and so on and so on. And those, those two kind of th uh, ways of thinking, they collapse. Uh, they, they collapse and, and, and they don't work all the time. Uh, 
How do you solve it? Get together as soon as possible. So for Brickland, we did some, uh, we did a, a mock-up, eh? we did some uh, UX design and some production and testing, and what we saw was that it didn't work. Oh, it didn't work. Eh? People clicked on it, which is a very big mistake in interactive documentary, I think. People clicked on it and they kept on clicking, and after a few clicks they went away. Because why? <coughs> there was no reason to click any longer. Eh? And the main reason was, of course, because there was no linear storytelling uh, um, element in it. It was all non-linear. Eh? You could do whatever you want. Eh? And another big problem was there was no emo in it. Eh? So we had to find emo. Eh? Um, <laughs> and we put, we put emo in, into the story, which is, which is the heart of every story, I think, uh, emo. Every story <coughs> has to have emo. Emo is, is very broad. And what we did was, within those three uh, uh, um, periods, remember, within those three periods, we put a central piece, which is, if you consume those three central stories, you watched a very traditional, <coughs> linear uh, documentary. And we also aired it as a traditional documentary. Yeah? And this was the part also from <coughs> gamification. Mm -hmm. You could uh, uh, skip it, but if you watch the first video, eh, then you release all the other media parts. That was a part of it, like Donkey Kong or Super Mario Bros. You cleared level one and then you get rewarded. Eh. So this was, and this was our second story world. Eh. This was our definite story world, eh, where you have an introduction, then you have your center stories, your three center stories, and then the different uh, media parts. Eh? And then we thought, how are we, how are we going to design it? Eh? And we released two development teams to do that. Eh? One from scratch, which costed a lot. Eh? The, the, that's one uh, big problem, especially in, in Europe, because our market is very small eh? with, with the different languages. Eh? There aren't a lot of interactive documentaries. Eh? Why? Because uh, the, the, the return on investment uh, is, is not enough, of course. Eh? So this was, is, was, was a high price, eh? but we also did, with the same media object, so with the same stories, we also designed one in Clint. Does, does anybody know Clint? Yeah? Clint is, is, is software to make video interactive. It's like, it's like Photoshop, eh? something like that, to make video interactive. But it's software, eh? not from scratch. Eh? So much easier. Eh? It's a walled garden, of course. I mean, you, you have some restrictions, but it was much easier. And hopefully I can let, me, let you show the video. Eh? So we made two versions. And, ah, come on. When we prepared the television, it worked, and now it didn't work. One second, and otherwise I will give it at the end of presentation. I wanted to show the video and a, a kind of pop quiz where you could choose which uh, version was made by the software and which was made by, uh, no, I will show you at the end on my laptop. There are some issues. So that was Brickland, and I will I will give you the clue already. Uh, this was the first version, which so with with uh, with some tiles. Eh? This was made by with Clint, eh? and we did some testing, user testing, and um, the, the almost the majority of the people liked this over the other version. The other version was 
like Netflix. Eh? It's a Netflix interface eh? where you get some recommendations and you get uh, the other parts of the story like this. This was also for, uh, designed from scratch. Uh, from scratch eh? But the user interface um, uh, defined the story eh? because it was the same story, the same elements, but the way you, you uh, uh, consumed it eh? was, was totally different. Eh? And this to, to say that the price of designing stories is not always the best option to do it very, very big. Sometimes the results are even better. Into my second uh, case and then a future project. Eh? Um, this is more about immersive storytelling. We wanted to find uh, a way to do explainer videos, which are really hot in, in Europe. Eh? A lot of newspapers <coughs> use it. You all know explainer videos. Eh? No, explainer videos, uh, most of the time with text, small text, with, with in different highlighted colors, eh? where you have some, most of the time, uh, rather uh, difficult issues explained in a very simple way. That's, in, in, a, in a nutshell, what explainer videos are. And we wanted to make a, a um, VR with 360 video. Eh? Uh, 360 video uh, in, uh, explainer video. Eh? And what we did was, we put two journalists, one of VTM, which is the, the commercial station in Belgium, one of VRT, which is the public broadcaster, <coughs> and we put them on a bike, and we uh, went uh, from the... Uh, the big market square in the heart of Brussels to their uh, um, uh, editorial uh, house, to their uh, uh, location. Uh, so, uh, yeah. I'm going to show the video at the end. So this is, this is part of the video I will show you uh, uh, at the end. Uh, uh, and we had some problems. And first of all, First of all, what we call it in immersive storytelling, at Python who ate the red syndrome, eh? voila, Python who ate the red syndrome. We had some difficulties with um, designing good immersive storytelling is, is always a combination of uh, exploration. Eh? A viewer, a VR, a VR consumer wants to explore, eh? he wants to explore, so you, you have to take your time to tell immersive storytelling. Eh? But on the other hand, if you do, if you do only exploration, eh, you have no story. You have no story. That's a big problem. Again, like very similar to Brickland, when there was no story. Eh. So Pycnoid Red Syndrome means eh, you always have to, you always have to think about what what scene is more narrative, and which scene is more explorative. Where, where can you explore? Eh? And I always compare it with, with, uh, with, the, uh, with the part of IKEA. Yeah. Everybody knows IKEA. Eh? Mm -hmm. All over the world, the, the, the map is similar. It's the same map. Eh? And you have the feeling that you are free to stroll around IKEA. But of course, eh? and you all know that, eh? it's a very well thought eh? uh, scheme to uh, lead you through the whole shop. Of course, if you are only looking for a new bed, you know the back ways, eh? uh, and you take the, 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 the... This is very simple to immersive storytelling. Eh? So if you design immersive story, uh, stories, eh, you always have to see that um, <coughs> the, the, the immersive storyteller as matador, I don't believe that. Eh? I know you can, you can attract people's attention with, with sound or with light or whatever, eh? Uh, but if you do that in a, in a, in a very uh, 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 abrupt way, I, I don't think you, you are designing good immersive storytelling. So you have to do it very subtle eh? and always think about uh, is this scene narrative or is this scene, uh, can you explore and make it a combination. Eh? What you don't want, and especially for 360 video, is what we call <coughs> dome VR. And dome VR, which is where, where as a viewer, eh? You were dropped somewhere, you can look around and that's it. It's the same with, with the Brickland example, eh, where you just click and that's it. Eh. The roller coaster VR videos were almost the death of VR, of course. Eh. Because the first time you had a roller coaster video, you were all right, nice. The second time, mm, okay, third time, kill me. Eh. <laughs> so now we need good stories for immersive video. Eh. And dome VR, where you just dropped, eh, are not so good stories. Eh. People want to interact, 
Yeah? And this is especially for 360 video, not that simple yeah? because you can do it, of course, you can do it with a lot of programs. But again, yeah, for this explainer video, we did the test with two uh, 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 ways to make uh, 360 video interactive, of course, with Unity or Unreal or whatever. Yeah? But, but not all the media companies have Unity developers. Uh, so it's a big problem. Right? They are very scarce in, uh, in, 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 in Europe. Unity developers are really wanted. Right? I'm not sure if it's here, the same thing in America. Um, but we used Vonda. Does anybody know Vonda? Yeah? Voilà. We used Vonda. And now there is Vonda Spaces. I'm not sure if you uh, took... Vonda Spaces is new. Yeah? It's very promising. I, I tested it already. And it's especially designed for uh, immersive training. Immersive training, and it's really easy to use. Yeah? And you can do pop quizzes. You can see your progression. You can see your progression. You can do branching tree stories, and so on and so on. All in Wanda. You can do that with Unity also, eh? if you have a lot of money or if you have a lot of time. Yeah? So we did we did it with Wanda. Hmm? It's easier than Unity. Or yeah, yeah. It's time. software. It's software. It's it's real. Unity is also software, but I mean, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's like Photoshop. It's really a, a walled garden. You don't have to. You, you don't you have to do a lot of drive. coding. No, oh, it's just drag and drop. You make some branching tree stories. It's uh, it's not it's not that hard. Yeah, it's not that hard, and it's cheap. And you do, you can do it on your own. Uh, I'm not cheap. sure if, if you if you uh, can work with Unity. I tried it once and it was. It was horrible. Yes. Well, uh, same experience here. <laughs> uh, same experience here. Uh, the next step: explainer videos was uh, to add some, some graphics into the story, of course. Uh, uh, but what we saw was that the, the immersive experience was lost when you put the graphics <coughs> in. Because graphics hmm, are not natural. Eh? You're, you're on a bike, on a bike, because we did some uh, point of view uh, shots of 360 video. You're on a bike in Brussels, and when there are graphics as an overlay, it didn't work, it took down the immersive experience. So what we did was we, we tried to incorporate the, the graphics by tracking, but also by color and stuff like that, into your environment. Huh? Into your environment. Huh? It did the trick a little bit. Huh? It didn't do wonders, but it did the trick a little bit. Huh? So your immersive experience was uh, rather uh, okay. Huh? And then we took it a, a step further. And of course, we made some location-based immersive uh, of the same video, eh? because you could, you, you could just see it on, on, on YouTube or download it on your Oculus or whatever. Eh? But we also did uh, um, uh, location-based, eh? of course, with the bike, uh, eh? but also with some smell, eh? with some smell in the room to make it very, because Brussels, if you haven't been to Brussels, it, it, it really has... Uh, a typical smell, mm. and of course, the smell changes during the route. Huh? Because you're uh, biking next to a canal, that doesn't smell really good. <laughs> um, and we also did some other things. We put some sensors on the bike and on the on the on the persons. Huh? So what we did was uh, uh, we 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 tested the noise. Huh? And we also tested by uh, the, the, the movement of the bike itself, eh, the quality of the bike paths in, 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 uh, in Brussels. And that data was incorporated in the, in the explaining video. We want to take it a little bit further within our future <coughs> projects. Eh, and because I teach storytelling, eh, and storytelling is, 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 a, is a little bit uh, well, for my students, they think it's outdated, and maybe they have a point. Eh? From storytelling to story yelling. Eh? Uh, yeah, and, and now we're talking about storyscaping. Eh? Storyscaping, and, and an essential thing about is is be part of the story. Eh? Be part of the story. And technology can help with that. Eh? For an example, this is just new. I should have put it on. I forgot it. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but this is the Insta. We're testing it for, for multiple storytelling. We just put it like this, and voila, probably the other way around. Voila, that's it. And it records 24-7 if you want to. 
Okay? And the Steadicam function is really nice. Huh? So if you walk around, if you talk to people, the sound is okay, especially when you talk to people that are really close. Huh? Uh, <coughs> the field of view is, is, is rather big. Huh? And now we're experimenting with, um, um, with hyper-local journalism, huh? where we uh, have five or six devices with a few persons, key persons, within that arena, storytelling arena, for example, <coughs> a, a school or a... Or a or um, uh, a hospital or something like that, eh? and they are recording, which is called reality television. Eh? Reality television was very expensive in the old days be because you had to film a lot, a lot, a lot. Eh? Now we solve it with these kind of devices, eh? or with GoPros or stuff like that. But this is just new. What's it eh? It's the Insta Go, Insta360 Go. It's, I think, 200 euros, something like that, 200 dollars. So, technology can help with that, mm -hmm. and a very important thing for immersive storytelling is, of course, presence design. Eh? Have the, 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 the feeling that you are really there. Eh? What you don't want is the Swayze effect. Eh? Yeah. For people who are a little bit older, eh? for people who are younger, this is Patrick Swayze. Very, <laughs> very hot in, in the 80s. Eh? Very hot in the 80s. Eh? And Patrick Swayze, uh, <coughs> this is from the film Ghost, eh? and the Swayze effect in immersive storytelling is where you have the, the effect that you are there, but you don't get noticed, eh? and you don't want that as a viewer. Eh? And how do you solve the Swayze effect? Eh? Always think about why am I here? Eh? Why am I here? And because my special, I, I'm, I'm more specialized in 360 video, not in uh, uh, animated VR, eh? more 360 video. And how can you solve it uh, with 360 video is most of the time if you move around, eh? if you have a function, if you, move, if you make it interactive, eh? if you have some choices or you can go in uh, a door or whatever, that's one thing, eh? make it interactive. And second, move around, but the problem, especially also for documentary, if you move around, eh, most of the time you're, you're standing in front with the camera and, and it, it doesn't work. Eh? So we did a lot of testing, and, and those are real pictures, eh, with some point of view solutions. Eh? And uh, this, was, this was my first experiment, eh? and it failed, eh? because what's, what's wrong with this, with this suit? Eh, so the, there is a person into it. Eh? And this is the, the Insta360 uh, Pro camera. What's the, what's the problem with this suit? Anne, pop quiz. So if you look through his eyes, you always have to, have to stand yeah. like this. Yeah, and it's also, it's also way too high. So what we did was we found a very small person, and then the perspective was a little bit better, but it was way too high wow. as a perspective. Because the, 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 that's a normal person, like me, and then your camera is even is ah, higher. There's a person in there. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Eh? So that was the suit of this. So that was our first experiment. Now we do it like this, which is, <laughs> yes, it looks stupid. I know it looks stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it does the trick. Eh? It does the trick. Eh? We stitch it in Unity. Eh? But you could say, well, it's not natural that the camera is in front of your face, but it is. <coughs> Because if you look at your shoulders, you're also a little bit in front of your face. So it's not that big of a problem. Huh? So now we do a lot of uh, filming with these kind of uh, uh, point of view solutions, huh? uh, which is very important if you want to move, of course. And acknowledge your person, for example, if he comes into the room, uh, acknowledge him or whatever. That's a way to make a role. Huh? Um, and then we had some problems with VR scripting. Eh, because a normal uh, script, you all know that, of course, eh, is something like that. Eh, this, eh, Robert McKee, uh, <coughs> I'm a big McKee fan. Eh, you have exposition, you go to a climax and you have a, a resolution. These are the, the, the scripts we use as a, as a, as a VR, eh, which is way more complicated. And what we saw was that the way you make a script, eh, with a heading and a scene number and stuff like that, it doesn't work for VR. It doesn't work. Eh, we tried it, it doesn't work. Eh? And what our script looks now is something like that. Yeah, it's stupid, but it works. Eh? So what we do is in the yellow circle, the inner circle, we always describe our character. What's the role of the character? 
What is he doing? Does he move around? And so on. In the second circle, you have your arena. And what is happening there with different persons and stuff like that. And then the outer circle is the outside arena. So our scripts, and it's, it's a bit stupid, but they really look like this. They really look like this in different uh, layers. Where you have your character, then on the location, <coughs> even with some arrows, if they are moving, you describe what the people are doing or what the moment is. And don't think, when you design uh, VR story stories, don't think in beats, uh, think in moments, uh, because beats don't uh, really, actions, uh, solo actions, not always work, uh, think in moments. Uh. And a good VR experience is what we call, you should have uh, multi-layer scenes. Uh. I always say uh, the Game of Thrones effect. Uh. When I watch a, a, a Game of Thrones episode, uh, I immediately want to watch it again. Because I have the feeling that I missed some crucial parts or some parts. And if you watch it the second time, you detect another layer and another layer and another layer. Uh. So I think, especially for fiction uh, storytelling, but also documentary, uh, you should leave uh, some open and you should have uh, multi-layer scenes. Uh. What we're now experimenting uh, with is, is um, data capturing via sensors and then using that data to uh, alter your, your experience itself. Uh. So for example, <coughs> if we're measuring the stress level, uh, the stress level, and when your stress level goes up, uh, the color of your room changes. Yeah, that's that's what we're doing now, huh? in VR or in uh, uh, video mapping, immersive rooms, hmm? video mapping, huh? uh, and you can do it the other way around. Huh? You could say if your stress level goes up, huh, you will get some uh, 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 easier parts, so your stress level goes down again. But if you want to do a really horror kind of situation, eh, you can detect which parts you really don't like and give you more parts like that. So we are experimenting with the Tesla suit eh, with different modes. Um, eh, and what I want to say is that the, the, the way, um, sorry, the, 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 the technology eh, defines how we tell stories, of course. Eh? And an essential, uh, a good story is a good story. That doesn't change a lot. Eh? But technology will redefine the story a little bit, eh? and especially with VR. Eh? <coughs> and this is what we call it, the, the, the real-time data capturing to alter your story. Voilà. I think in a brief, it was a little bit... I think we have some time for questions, of course. But this is my main story. I will show you maybe the videos in a few minutes, if it works, eh, on my laptop, so you can see the, the two parts, eh, and you can choose. Uh, but this is what I want to tell about traditional storytelling and then the relationship with, with immersive storytelling. Do you have questions? Off topic, on topic? Yes? I didn't totally understand how, how you make people in 360 experiences, um, how you give them the feeling to be there and to be seen because the nature of these experiences, you are there, but you are not seen, right? So I didn't really get the point. No, no. Um, you could do that, eh? but in good VR, eh, you are noticed. So for example, if you, if you <coughs> go, come inside a room and everybody looks at you, then you feel noticed, then you have a role. That's, that's an easy thing. Eh? But the present design is very important. My students always make mistakes. For example, they, they use music in, in VR videos, which is very strange. Because most of the time, when you're in a room, there is no music. Eh? And if you want to use music, eh, try to have the music on during the production, when you're recording. Because then it is in the acoustics of the room, of course. See. And that has always to do with, with present design. Eh? You always want the feeling that you are really there. Eh? And, and a, a person goes into detective mode, eh? and that's a big problem. Eh? 
If you say, look at that, look at that, look at that, most of the time they are looking there. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And you have some rubbish in a corner there, believe me, they noticed. Uh -huh. And we did some testing on it. Uh, there is some research and it, it's true. Yeah? So the detective mode. Uh, so it always, it's, always, it's always difficult because of course you want to determine that your viewer looks at that position. But the way you do it is very important in VR storytelling. Yeah? And everybody is saying, yeah, you should turn off the light or, 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 or have arrows point to it. Or, <laughs> no, really. Even arrows? <laughs> yeah, of course. And in training, for training, it's no problem. Eh? For training, you should do that. For immersive training, do it. Yeah? For documentary filmmaking, you should uh, try to do it a little bit more subtle. Any other questions? I was curious more about the environment um, for VR collaborations in Europe, especially around curriculum. So because uh, I run the public VR lab in Brookline, and because you know different tools have changed, we've used Londo, we've used Unity, we've used Reach.Love, I'm curious if you're seeing in Europe sort of any curricular consortiums or folks sharing curriculum or working together towards standards or yeah. Tell me a little bit about that landscape. Well, we, we are currently doing a, a cooperation with South Africa. Yeah, because they have a postgraduate uh, VR storytelling course there. Yeah. Uh, and we are going to, to work together with them and also in Toronto. Yeah, we are also because the, the VR scene in Toronto is rather big. Um, within Europe, eh, there, there are some, we, we, do, we do collaborate with, <coughs> with the people of Clint and Wolna because they're from France. Uh, but uh, within, within the school system, not that much, because there is a lot of competition. And um, real VR programs, as such, eh, are, are, not, are hard to find, eh, are hard to find. Most of the time, they're part of, of video studies or, or documentary studies, eh, but not as such on, on, on VR. Eh. Uh, that's why... Uh, when I specialized in, in VR storytelling a few years ago, there was nothing about it. It was, it was, uh, uh, so, but we're all, always interested. <laughs> We'd love to collaborate. Yeah, yeah. We do our own production. Yeah, we do our own production with our students. Uh, and uh, sometimes we work with other students, like, like the, 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 the interactive multimedia design, what we call it, the, the people who, who, uh, who, who code and stuff like that, uh, and but uh, the, the collaboration is is is, is rather hard. It's uh, difficult. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, I especially loved all the different diagrams and maps you showed. I just have a very small question about yeah. where you got that Disney map, which was amazing. Yeah. Um, and then maybe just a a, a, a sort of broader mm -hmm. question about. Um, the sort of story templates you were showing yeah. towards the end. Um, and I'm just sort of wondering in terms of how you teach or how you collaborate, I mean, how much variation do you encourage um, from you know, that story template of starting with character, arena, broadening out? I mean, I think I can imagine that there's all sorts of advantages to how that template you know, grabs somebody's attention, leads them in a particular kind of way. And I'm sure you have research to sort of to, mm -hmm. to, to back that up. But are there some limitations to having a kind of fixed template model of character or an individual character being at the center? I mean, is there variation? Is there modification that's yeah. possible? And yeah. What I find striking is that my students always tell very traditional <coughs> stories. Yeah, very. Tra they don't experiment. They're not that creative. No, really. And and I've seen it all over the world. And I think I know why that is eh? because they what they find good journalism eh? or good stories eh? they think about probably here in, in the new york times or whatever and they they want to make something similar to that eh? and what we say eh, but like for example the vrt i'm coming to your question eh? the vrt the public broadcaster says we don't need any journalists we have way too many already and all the younger people want to become a traditional journalist. So what we need are digital juniors, very digital storytellers. That's the only profile they're now searching for. So 
when my, when my students, they start with a very traditional way of thinking with characters and attention. And I think it's very, very important. I think it's very important that you know where your story leads you and your story angle, your attention span and so on and so on. But I think if you then uh, want to tell your story in a transmedia way on different platforms with public participation uh, and so on and so on, that template doesn't work. Sometimes it works for each individual story, but not as a whole. So if we really design transmedia stories, eh, we always make a story world. And that's different because it's a story world is not about a character or a quest or whatever. So it's a combination. It's a combination. Uh, you mentioned the detective mode and how yeah. they'll never look in the direction you're pointing them yeah. to. With a, with, uh, with a grain of salt. Uh, is, is there a way of, um, uh, sort of uh, embracing that and telling a sub story in the rubbish bin? That, you know, have a shiny object in the room and then have the real story you're trying to tell? Yes. Knowing that yeah. your audience is never going to follow the yeah. st story you thought. You yeah, or in a second view, they follow another story. And, so, and especially with, with uh, 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 spatial sound. You can do that. For example, what we did was in the main story, layer one, in the main story, your character is talking to another character. And he's noticed he has a role. But you hear eh, behind you some rumor. Some rumor, some people whispering and stuff like that. Eh? But in the, the most of the people eh, in the first viewing, they, they really paid attention to the person because he's telling. It's narrative. It's not exploration. It's narrative. Python or Red Syndrome. In the second viewing, the first thing you do is turn around, and then with <coughs> spatial sound, the, 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 the whispering becomes hearable, of course. But that's the way how we try, try, try to do that. That was fiction. It was a fiction. It was not, it was not documentaries, but it was, uh, it was fiction. So yeah, try to do that. Eh? And of course, you have to lead a eh, storyteller as, as a method or OK but make it subtle. And for example, you can also do, do, do framing. Eh? And framing, not in a, in a bad way, but I mean, if you have one object, really one object within your sphere, your attention goes there. If you have two, you make it more difficult. You can have three or four or five or six or no object. That's also a possibility. Yeah? I'm, um, I'm curious about the size and the demographics of the audience you use to test out some of these ideas with and to make these assumptions. And then sort of likewise, I'm curious about the audience, the, the size and demographics again, of just this audience in Europe in general, who's got access to this equipment, who's using it. What does that look like? Nobody. <laughs> no, that's a big problem. Eh? The first times we, we did some uh, immersive storytelling, eh? We did a, a very, very big survey in Belgium eh, uh, and who owned a VR goggles. Because, okay, you can do it on your smartphone eh, or you can do it even on a cardboard, eh, but the best experience is with, with, some, with some glasses, VR gl glasses. Eh. And we did a big survey and it was, I think, less than 2%. Less than cardboard included. Eh? Cardboard included. Eh. So that was a big problem. Eh. So that's why I believe, and, 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 and that's another way of, of uh, now it's, it's, it's growing. Eh? It's growing also in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, in Europe, it's growing, the audience is growing, but it's not on the tipping point. Eh? But what I believe is the location-based immersive experiences. Eh? Location-based immersive experience uh, at a venue or at a conference or whatever, because then you can make it on really good glasses with some extra stuff, with some, with some haptics. Yeah. For example, uh, Mobile Vikings is a telephone op operator in, in Belgium, eh? and we did a commercial for them where you are in a Viking boat and you run down a ski uh, slope. And we really taped it like that. Eh? Viking boat, yeah, 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 it was, it was crazy. <laughs> it was like fun. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. <laughs> The location-based experience, you see the same boat, a eh, rather big wooden boat. Eh? It's put on a device that it trembles. Eh? Then there is some uh, uh, wind, eh? but we also threw some ice at the persons who are in the boat. <laughs> really? Yeah. 
all to have that immersive experience. And that was, that was a really good experience. So that's why I believe lo location-based has some potential. Huh? But you will see it growing. The, the, but your remark is, is really, really uh, applicable. Yeah, that's right. It's a big problem. I think web VR eh, will solve that problem also, of course. And because there are two problems. Eh? First of all, you have to have your VR glasses. That's one thing. But second of all, you also have to have content. Eh? And if you can stream it with web VR, eh, with, if the <coughs> latency is, is solved eh, because they're getting there, then you can have all the time, all the content you want. Other questions? This haptic suits you experiment, do you think they will be in some future times part of storytelling or what we, experience? We, we, no, what we do now with the haptic suits is, is see it as a, as a, a production tool. As a production tool, huh? I was in. No, our the idea is not that users can feel. No, sometimes we, we we use motion capturing, for example, to make a digital avatar in a virtual environment. Huh? Mm -hmm. So, for example, in in in, in Japan, uh, uh, the the virtual YouTubers. Yeah, I'm not sure. Do you have it in America? Virtual YouTubers. Yes, it's really hot. Huh? It's really hot and very, very fast growing market. Huh? Of course. Especially for Japan, because I think there, eh, because of their their uh, way of animation and stuff like that, it really works. Eh? But also in Belgium, it's becoming uh, more and more popular. Eh? So what, what? How does it look like? Virtual YouTuber is you put on a suit, you have some some software, and you're in your uh, uh, your your home. Mm -hmm. You create an an, an um, a digital environment, eh? and you can be uh, very weird looking, but on the internet. You are the big star. So you become an avatar. <laughs> eh? Yeah, avatar. digital avatar. Yeah. With all the emotions and stuff like that. And it really responds very good. Eh? And what we saw, what we see is that, that a lot of younger people are experimenting with that. So we, we are also trying that out. Eh? Digital avatars into stories. Especially for children programs. It works very, very good. Eh? And the production cost is very low. Eh? Because you don't have to create unique animation for each thing. You just create a character, of course, that's, a, that's work. Eh? But you create a character and then you can uh, do whatever you want into a studio. Yeah. Other? Yes? Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go for it. You I, I was, uh, I'm curious about, we're, we're <coughs> in the community at our space here in the US and um, trying to really establish the art in the public interest, not just on the commercial side. And so I'm curious what kinds of things you're seeing that are coming up in Europe that are predominantly focused on the public interest side of, of VR. So not game-based, not uh, commercially focused. Are you seeing sort of an art DIY movement? Are you seeing community-based art centers picking up? VR, what's kind of happening in the, on the grassroots level? A project I just worked on was, was a very simple project. It was uh, for elderly homes, eh? people who are uh, in early stages of dementia. And we just uh, filmed in, in very small towns eh? the main street and the main market. Eh? And then those images, those 360 videos are used to help people remember their street and their market squares and stuff like that. That's a very simple thing. Eh? What, what, what I see is that VR in journalism doesn't work. Eh? A lot of, uh, like New York Times, they experimented a lot. It stopped a little bit, voila. Eh? And it's the same in Europe. Eh? So what, what, what I see potential, of course, gaming. Eh? And then training in, in training and also therapy. So for example, in, in Holland, just a few miles from my, from my house, there is a company specialized in uh, flight anxiety. And they solve it with, with, with location-based immersive experiences. Uh, so a lot of training and art. There are some experiments, but not that much. I'm not sure how, how it's here, but not that much. Yeah. Yeah. Why doesn't it work in journalism? Just because it's expensive, or because Sorry, what? why doesn't it work in journalism? Because it's expensive, or no? Because because I think they made a lot of mistakes. Eh? Um, what I believe it works as an add-on in journalism. Mm -hmm. eh? 
there it works perfectly. And we did a lot of projects with, 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 the, with the two biggest television companies. Uh, and and uh, as an add-on it works, for example, for a television program you could say, well, uh, that's a very traditional linear television program, but do you want to see the arena where the people were fighting? Uh, just uh, click here and you can see it as an extra feature. Eh? But they made a lot of mistakes because they told very tradi sorry, traditional stories with no VR comp uh, component in, in, uh, brought into it. Eh? So for example, a very important component is your arena. Eh? Arena-driven stories are very... Uh, um, uh, are very suitable for VR if you have an arena driven story. Do you understand what I mean? No. And to, yeah, could you please maybe explore, explain a bit more about Yeah, an arena, it can, be, it can be a, a, an apartment block or something, or yeah. it can be a, a, a school, or it can be a, a, room. a room. A room, it can be a room, of course. If, if, you, if you start from locations, eh, location based driven stories, then most of the time it can work for immersive storytelling and you can use it. But if you tell, for example, a, a very traditional story with no real components with, 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 with location or a direct link to location, maybe you should tell it in a different way, in a linear story. Do you have an example of such an arena story without I think the, the New York Times piece of the street children. Uh, oh. Uh, yeah, it, uh, the name escapes me. Where, where you see the uh, arena of, of all those children where they live in the street and in, in abandoned houses and stuff like that. That was a nice piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they made a lot of mistakes in journalism. And they all wanted to, to do VR, yeah? and most of the time it didn't work. And people see that. Yeah. There is nothing it's wrong. Often it's just boring, right? Yeah. It's, it's not the right. Uh, uh, medium to tell some stories. Yeah. There's not, there's no, there's no problem with traditional stories. Huh? I'm fond of video, but sometimes I listen to companies and they say, "Well, we want a video," and then I listen to them and, and, and I say, "No, you don't want a video. You want a brochure." <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, don't hire me. <coughs> don't hire me. You don't want a video. Huh? So always listen. Always try to think. This is my story. And, and that's transmedia storytelling, of course. Eh? This is my story. What are the platforms I'm going to use? What is the medium I'm going to use? What is the format? And what is the relationship? That's transmedia. And do I have public participation? And where in the story is the public participation activated? And that's in a nutshell transmedia storytelling. All right. Any other questions? Feel free. I have some more about it, but we can, I don't know if this is interesting for all of you, some journalism questions. I, I wonder if you thought about graphics we are for journalism, so this unreal virtual reality. But it, let's be honest, if it's interesting, we can discuss it <laughs> later as well. Looks like they are interested. <laughs> <laughs> and sorry, can you repeat it? Did you think about unreal VR for, <coughs> for journalism, so um, graphic based? But real virtual reality, not 360? Ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, but the, 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 the cost eh? mm. and it's, it's rather high, and that's a big problem. We're now experimenting with, with uh, creating VR worlds eh? just by dragging and dropping AutoCAD files. And there is an AutoCAD file of every object <coughs> made. Eh? So if you can do that, and we're experimenting together with another school with that, if you can do that, then you can make vir virtual reality, animated virtual reality words within seconds or minutes or hours, something yeah. like that. Yeah. But if you want to really make it now from scratch, you pay a lot. And most of the time, media companies don't have that budget. I'm not sure how it is here, but in Belgium, <laughs> newspapers are bleeding, broadcast companies are bleeding, yeah. so they don't have the, the money for that. I thought it might be cheaper to do Unreal worlds or graphics, but no, no, no. It's 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 way more expensive. 360 video is, is, is okay. Yeah, if, if you do it the wrong way, yeah, then but then yeah. it's just no, no. But 360 video is is, is 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 rather cheap yeah, because there is no well, eh, there is no editing in 360 video. Eh? There used to be stitching, but now the new cameras, the auto stitching is rather okay. Mm. Eh, but there is no editing. Eh? I studied for a television director. When I do 360 video, it's it's crazy. Eh? All I have to do is this. Action! <laughs> and cut. 
That's it. I studied for four years to do that. I used to say, well, an over shoulder shot and a dolly shot, and oh, I'm going to use that lens and that lens. No. Record, down, action. That's it. But, but how, I mean, can you just maybe dwell a little bit more on the grammar of, say, 360 video? And I mean, how, I mean, yeah, so you said, okay, there's not maybe editing in the same way or the idea <coughs> of the camera moves differently, but how, I mean, it's mise en scène. You yeah. know, it, you, you yeah. use that word, eh? it's yeah. mise en scène. And that's why, and that's why uh, 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 theater directors are very good uh, VR storytellers. Mm -hmm. yeah. huh? So, for example, eh, also when, when you are watching a play, you can also look to the right of the stage, to the left of the stage, and so on. A good play director will make you look there, there, or there. Eh? By light, by sound, by uh, uh, the mise en scène, by the play, and so on. Eh? So, uh, do you have close-ups in VR? Of course you have close-ups. But that's how you move your characters around. Eh? So, For example, one of the, the worst VR videos, and very popular in the beginning, was the Cirque du Soleil video of VR. Eh? Why? Everything was just in front of you. And you look to the right and to the left and there was an empty, empty seat. That's it. So you had no reason to look around. What we see now, with, with, uh, especially with dance, VR, dance videos in VR, they adapt their choreography on, into VR. So for example, the, the, the dancer goes over you. He jumps over you. And your attention immediately in a very natural way, will follow. So one of the big things is, is also define your character, your guide into immersive storytelling. Because one of the things is, and I made a lot of mistakes with that, eh, in VR, every character is a hero. Every character is a hero. I, on set, sometimes people, eh, they think, well, he's talking, eh, I'm just going to pick my nose or something. Believe me, you noticed it. Eh? <laughs> So it's, it's, if you direct for, for VR, eh, always remember that every character must be informed and has to play a part. I mean, just looking, eh, looking stupid is, a, is a hard to do. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> eh? So, so those are, I hope uh, I will answer your question. With, 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 so it's uh, prepare your scene very thoroughly before before, I mean, especially your mise-en-scene. That's what my students always forget. It. Okay, what are we going to do? Just do something. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. So really define the, the, the places of the, of the characters also in, in, in order to get the right picture or the right frame, the, the, the right cadrage, eh? if you want a close or if you want a movement and so on. Eh? So for example, um, we, we did a, a piece in a museum, eh, which, is, which is rather community-based, eh, in a museum, and we wanted to move the camera, and it was in, in the clay museum, eh, the, the brick museum. Eh. And what we did is we, 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 we took a guide in traditional wardrobe eh, uh, from that time, eh, and it was um, like a little, a little uh, uh, what's it called, Beel, uh, wheel barrier, something like that? No. No. Who am I? Eh? And with, with stones, traditional uh, clay uh, from that time, and we put the camera on, uh, on the wheel barrier. And that, in that way, he could move around in a very traditional way. Well, natural way. As a guide in a museum, you get away with that. But you moved around because people want to move. That's one of the, the biggest mistakes in the beginning of VR. Eh? You, and in animated VR, you can move around. By just clicking and stuff, that's that's rather nice. Eh? Dome VR in 360 video, people can't move around, and that's all. But that's what they always say. Eh? Oh, uh, did you like the experience? Yes, but I wanted to walk around, but it doesn't it doesn't work. And now with the new glasses, it can work, of course. Eh? Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Sorry to interrupt your lunch. <laughs>